everybody. Hi, my name is Corey Spanish. Uh, I uh, live in Manchester. I'm a Free State Project early mover, uh, coming up on six years in New Hampshire now. And I'm here to introduce a panel on how Free State Project participants uh, impact New Hampshire politics. And here, uh, they have asked me to mention one thing before we get started, and that is that there are still tickets available for the off-site dinners tonight. Uh, so if you were thinking I would love an off-site dinner, but they surely must be sold out by now, congratulations, you were wrong. Uh, you can still get in on the off-site dinners. You can go to the registration desk if you're interested in that, and they'll hook you up. Uh, other than that, uh, I am only here to introduce our panel. So here is our moderator, Mira Yakov, and she is going to take it from here. Hello, everybody. I'm Rob. Hi, my name is Marav Yakov. I live here in Manchester. I'm a free state now, moved uh, to the state six years ago with my family. Uh, the, all the people ask me, where are you from? And I never know the right answer to that question. So I have an accent from Israel, and I moved from Colorado. If it makes sense, <laughs> go with that. Um, when I moved here, uh, first, uh, I, this took some time to pay attention to what's going on. Free State Project is extremely active. There's an extremely active community of activists here in New Hampshire. And it took some time to solve through this and find out what's missing or how can I help. And it turns out that recruiting candidates to run for the New Hampshire State House, which is a very big body of 400 people, is one of those impossible tasks that people shy away from. It's just too difficult. So I took it on uh, with friends. And uh, we started recruiting in 2012. Uh, Shem Kellogg, who is no longer with us, uh, was a founder of this uh, group together with me. And Shem passed away since uh, at a young age. And um, we uh, formed an official path, a political action committee, to oblige and to, to, to follow the laws of the state of New Hampshire and make sure we report on donations, both directions, in and out. Uh, according to the law. So that, that was the purpose of the PAC. Uh, today, um, the PAC is the PAC's members are Kit Carson, Mark Wooden, and myself. Uh, I'll introduce them in a minute. And um, we are still at the same mission. We are recruiting candidates to run for the Amsterdam State House. Uh, today's uh, panel is about our success stories and about how well we have been doing here in New Hampshire uh, as a community in the legislature. And, um, I uh, yeah, want to make sure that this uh, panel is as dynamic as possible. So I know most of the panels uh, just allow for a few minutes at the end for questions. This one, you can come up here and ask questions in the middle. We will welcome your questions during, we'll stop what we're doing, and address uh, your question or concern or idea. So feel free to you know, walk forward, come here and grab the mic and, and ask the question when you need. So, on the panel with me today, today is Mark Rodin. Mark has uh, two heads, he's very, very known, known in the community, he has two big roles here. One is the Pokemon Realtor, very important, we all buy houses with Mark all the time. And um, in the second uh, leadership role in the community, Mark served uh, as a state representative in the, in the house for four years. Um, and during that, for two out of the four years, he was the legislator of the year by the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. That's a very big prize of uh, award to get. And Mark, they got it twice. Next to Mark is uh, Jess Edwards. Jess and his family's wife uh, moved here like, about five years ago. And just for, and, and Naomi followed her daughter, which is fantastic because one other thing we do here is we unite families apparently. So they all came here, um, you know, the daughter first, the parents later, and they just didn't waste a moment and became active in this community immediately upon arrival. And uh, again, when the time was right, you have to wait two years before you can run uh, to the state house. And when time was right, he ran for the New Hampshire State House, got elected his first try, his first term. He's very active in the legislator, he's very active outside of the legislator, and you can uh, see him wearing the Boy Scouts uniform today. And if you want to ask him about that, after the event, not, not now. But that's one of the things he does. Thank you. And uh, last, uh, Kim Carson. So there's no lame time, and he's not on the agenda. And, uh, special guest. He's a special secret guest. And uh, Jess and I thought we'd suck him, bring him in, but now we decided to show your face. Uh, so when he's here with us, um, he, as I said, he's a member of the pack, but he's a, um, a very um, knowledgeable and um, important consultant or, or advisor on any political matter in the state and beyond the state. 
So if you have any question about legislation, legislator, uh, history of legislation bills in Yamsha, but, but beyond Yamsha, please uh, uh, find Keith and ask him all those questions. He, uh, I'm sure, give you a very uh, educated answer and a good one. And with that, we'll finally start the panel, and Mark, you're gonna be the first to lead us using that mic. And, um, yes, you're on. So uh, the first question I want to ask you, Mark, is uh, give us a little bit of the history of free senators running for office getting elected in New Hampshire. Okay, sure. Thank you, Rob, and uh, thanks for my moderators. I appreciate everybody being here today. We might we mainly talk about legislative victories today, although there have been tons of local elections where dozens and dozens of uh, Free State Project participants have been involved with the level making a big impact. But our folks a little bit more on the, the legislative issues. And the first Free State Project mover was a little, who ran for the House to be elected was in 2006. That was Joel Winters, who got, got elected as a Democrat. So and every two years in the after is the election cycle for the state uh, legislature. So when you know, 2006, 2008, 2010, we went from one to four, 14, 15, and 18, and 17 free staters elected in those subsequent electoral cycles. Well, of course, a lot of them were uh, re-elected, but every year we have some new people as others drop out. And that's pretty impressive for you know, people who were new to the state. In many cases, didn't know that many uh, people in their towns. They really got out there and worked hard to meet the voters, get known, get active in their communities. I got elected twice in the town of Goffstown. I only lived there less than a year. Didn't really know anybody, but had a lot of uh, volunteers. I did do campaign helpers from around our Liberty community. Worked in aggressive campaign and got elected. Jess Edwards has a summer experience when he got first elected. But what we wanted to talk about was once you're in the house, how are, but before I do, let me um, introduce a couple of other people in the room who are uh, legislators. Right now we have Glenn Dickey, he's currently in the state house, first or second term, Glenn? First term. First term, he's also on the local school board. Carol McGuire is on her fourth or fifth? Fifth. Fifth term out of Evelyn. <coughs> yeah, she's the first uh, free stater in the legislature to be appointed as a chairman committee. So she's in leadership, probably the most influential small liver training legislator in the country over the last uh, 10 years. Seriously. Next year, Dan McGuire served two or three terms. Three. Three terms. Uh, he, was, he was on the finance committee, which is a place where the magic is made and some of the, the worst kind of magic is done. And thank goodness Dan uh, was there to keep an eye on things. Both of the McGuire shows were extremely influential over a number of years. Besides just being elected in the state house, oh, Mike's right there. Mike Sylvia, on your third term, Mike? Third term. Third term out of Belmont, New Hampshire. So all of uh, these people are available. Is there more? Slightly. Oh. We have there's a lot of people here that are involved at the local state level. And um, a couple things. Once you're in the state house, you're most influential position is as a committee member. Everybody's on a committee committee. We're talking about the House, not the Senate. Uh, took their 20 people on a committee, 20 committees, 400 state reps. Only three quarters of those people show up every day, so now you're one of 15. Often the votes are eight, seven, nine, six, like that. So just being there voting for less government, more liberty on every vote every day uh, across dozens or hundreds of votes makes a difference. And it's done quietly, sadly. People, there's no fanfare, but you're making a, an impact. To go above that, if you're vocal in your committee, as Jess is, as the inquirers are, uh, as I've been, and, I, and probably Glenn's, you speak up when you really know a subject, because there are a lot of stupid people in the legislature. <laughs> Not these people, these guys are the trained, they're very smart, but. Uh, the legislature here is truly representative of the general public. A lot of people don't know what they're doing. They don't even read the bills, they don't even know the laws. So 
So if we get our people in there to make a cogent argument about why uh, this new legislation is superfluous and needed, uh, is unconstitutional, or it is uh, just bad public policy, then we can make a real difference. Because you're going to sway that middle ground in the committee who doesn't really know why they should or shouldn't support it. One more area where we could really need an influence is on a, um, a caucus, if you will, in the House of the House Republican Alliance. HRA for short. Carol McGuire co chaired that for a number of years, and to Amazon it as well. And it's, this group represents sort of more to the right, more conservative, truly fiscally conservative, small government Republicans. We have a lot of squishy middle water Republicans in the House, but this HRA holds the, um, the Republican people accountable on their votes and makes recommendations on every single bill that comes before the House. There are about a thousand bills every year. And because of the work of uh, free staters, libertarian types have done on the HRA, it's helped push the Republican Party uh, elected officials in the legislature more to the right, this way to you, to the right, uh, to really to appreciate uh, the small government. So there are very real impacts. You don't see them every day, you don't see them in the news, but it's happening. The, the Kevin Ball pack uh, that I'm going to present here today is a uh, nonpartisan. This is a very important part of what we do. Uh, we recommend that you run with the biggest, the party that controls your district or is uh, most likely to get elected in your district, whether it's Republican or Democrat. We do not recommend running as libertarian uh, for some for good reasons, and I can uh, spell them out. But uh, but the key to success is to run with the party that is. And going to win in your district or move to the district uh, of the party of your liking. Um, a lot of uh, the legislation that we work on and, and our reps work on take a long time to achieve. Those processes are, could be a decade long, very lengthy, uh, maybe more. Some, some reps can attest to that. And, and the game is about having long vision and long breath. If you want to make a quick change tomorrow, that's how to get by. But if you're in it for the long term, uh, you have, and, you, and you take the right steps, then good chances you can achieve uh, your goal. And with that, I'm going to uh, go to Jess Edwards, and I'm going to tell some of the success stories. And let's start with the Croydon bill. Um, and this bill, we had a long history, and you can start whatever you want with this history and take it from there. Um, so I'm, <coughs> I'm Jess Edwards. I, I'm on the panel, I think, to help. Uh, let you know how easy it is to become a stick. <laughs> if, if I could do it, I could do it. Um, I uh, am in my first term, uh, which means I did several months uh, in 17 and now a couple months this year. And uh, I want to give credit to, uh, to, to Jody Underwood and her, and her husband Ian. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Croydon uh, bill because it represents perhaps the most significant uh, accomplishment of uh, anyone with the Free State Project, in my opinion. I had absolutely nothing to do with it, uh, other than to show up at the signing ceremony. But, uh, but Jody started pushing the idea a decade ago, I believe, that the, a little more than a decade, I, I didn't want to age it too much. Uh, but uh, started with the idea that for these small towns that don't offer um, some grades, you know, not every, not every town offers every grade. That for those uh, towns that didn't offer a, a grade level, that the school district could contract out with uh, an appropriate provider for that individual student. And so I believe that you had five or so recently um, uh, students that wanted ended up going to Montessori schools, and, um, and she got sued. Croydon got sued uh, because uh, the education department doesn't like competition. And so uh, what the Underwoods were doing in Croydon was, was making sure that it, each individual kid had an opportunity to get the education that was appropriate to them. And they were getting sued and blocked by it. Uh, new legislature uh, came in and we immediately picked up a Croydon bill to, to turn it into law. 
that uh, school districts uh, of a certain characteristic could go ahead and, and do these contracts. Uh, and I think that was the, 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 the motivation to get the Department of Education to quit suing you so they could see what would happen to the law. Uh, and so we were able to pass it. The governor got it signed. Uh, everyone you know, showed up to, to enjoy uh, getting their photo taken with, with Jody. To, to, and thank you for letting me uh, steal some of your thunder up there. And if I, if I missed anything that's critical about this, please speak up because it, it's, it's, it's your baby. I, I feel like I'm describing your baby. Right sure. I just want to, Michelle LaBelle gets tons of credit for Shepherd. Michelle LaBelle is a rock star here. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, good point, thank you. Uh, the, the, so that's, that's probably the biggest, most strategic thing that we've accomplished. Um, uh, we, we, but we've done some other good things, lots of other good things. Uh, probably another one uh, was spearheaded uh, by a group of uh, libertarians, free standers, uh, Amanda Bolton specifically was in the leadership, uh, and then some other representative, Elizabeth uh, Edwards, I, I, I met her briefly. Uh, she, she was pushing, they were pushing the idea that Narcan ought to be available because we were having so many uh, people dying from opioid overdoses that we wanted to make Narcan, they wanted to make Narcan um, uh, more readily available so that we could save some of these lives. Because as long as somebody is alive, there's hope. And so, so we, uh, based on their work, we got the law passed, and, uh, passed with the sunset provision because the previous governor didn't want to go too far out on that limb. And so this past legislature, um, uh, Amanda helped me become the sponsor to the bill that had Nar the sunset date for Narcan uh, repeal. So, so, uh, so we're good to go as far as we can see in the future. And so although we don't uh, win every battle, uh, we win some really big ones, and we're winning more of them. And the more, uh, the more that we have good representatives out there fighting as a team, the better we'll do. So um, I, I came to a Liberty Forum um, seven, eight, nine years ago, and went to one of these sessions, and I had no idea I would someday be a state rep. So if you're just sitting there and you're going, oh, it's kind of interesting, you, you don't know. It really may become interesting. We hope, we hope you consider running, and we hope that if you do run, you take advantage of uh, getting ball back uh, so they can uh, teach you how to uh, run and win. Um, and if you think you may run, uh, or if you're in this room as a representative or an honorable, uh, please come to the tailgate party on the 19th of May at my house. It's a, it's, a, it's a mixer, so we can get everyone all fired up to run, and it's also a fundraiser. So, 19 May, uh, my place. Thanks, Jess. This uh, last election in 2016, once the election day was over, you could hear the sigh of relief all over the state when finally we had the Republican governor. I moved here six years ago, and I was under the reign of Democratic governors until this year, until uh, 2017, when uh, Governor Sonoma became governor. And uh, I've seen uh, fantastic reps fighting again and again for, for the good bills and often failing, and sometimes it was stopped at the governor's desk. It was so frustrating at times. But uh, as soon as Sonoma got in, with this huge sigh of relief, came the Constitution of Air Review, and Keith is going to talk about that. Thank you, and before I talk about that, I just wanted to let everyone know there's a raffle. We're going to be giving out two books towards the end of the panel, and here are the books. This is Hype by Carla Moore. A lot of it um, involves Shem Kellogg, who again was mentioned earlier, a co-founder of the Get Involved Pack. Um, he had a 100% rating by the NHLA. And then the other book is James O'Keefe's new book, and it is signed. So that's pretty cool. So we're gonna be giving out both of these. Corey, really awesome, by the way. Thank you, Corey. He, if you haven't signed up for the raffle yet, and I know a lot of you have, he's actually passing that out right now so you can sign up for the raffle and we'll be doing that. So my social should be talking about constitutional hearing. That's awesome, I love constitutional hearing. So this has actually been an issue all over the country, obviously. Uh, New Hampshire wasn't the first state to pass this. Vermont already had it since it was created. 
So this is like some people can say, well, how come you don't have constitutional carry, right? You're the freest state in the country, and even the law has it. Well, it took many years, and um, before the free state even started, there were bills in New Hampshire to create constitutional carry, and that never happened. But, um, oh, before I talk about this particular issue, or any issue, um, we could probably do like a whole HBO five season series on winds that were influenced by free staters. So we don't have like you know five years to talk about this. So if I mention or don't mention someone and they're in the room, I'm sorry if I missed you. I mean, we can't talk about everyone and everything you've done, but thank you. So constitutional carry did pass finally last year. It was signed by Governor Sununu. And it was actually the best constitutional carry law ever signed by anyone in the world. So we now have, without question, the best constitutional carry in the United States. Before that, right before that, there was a big effort, and I'm doing the whole story in reverse. So right before that, there was a big effort by another activist who was mentioned already, Michelle LaBelle, who was actually discriminated against. Um, I don't know why they discriminated against her, but she, she tried to reapply for her um, license to carry. It's basically to carry concealed, like with a coat on. And she was denied by her police chief for no good reason. So, you know, I don't know if they discriminated against her because she's a woman or she's a gun rights activist or education activist or ran for state rep. Who knows? But the fact is, she was discriminated against. That made headlines. And um, she won, of course, eventually she won. And, but that was a good reason to help sign the bill. But even before that, her and other great activists started to push, but they looked into the whole history of why New Hampshire didn't have constitutional carry. Because in, like, I think it was 1915, 1920, it was actually banned. We used to have constitutional carry until then. And it turns out it was to discriminate against French Canadian union workers in Manchester, foreigners that were working at the mills. So that was the reason we didn't have to begin with. So the whole thing was about discrimination. So there was a big story made about that. And then it turned out Michelle appeared and they discriminated against her. So it worked really well. But before that, free standards actually, constitutional period wasn't a huge issue in 2008, 2010, anywhere in the country. I mean, people were talking about it. But we even had Republican candidates for governor in New Hampshire that really weren't even, didn't even know what it was, really. They're like, well, what's that? So free state lawyers and gun groups and other people in gun groups that weren't free staters actually had to educate our candidates for governor in 2008, 2010, 2012 about what constitutional carry was, get them on board. So if you look eight years ago, we didn't even have our Republican candidates for governor on board with this. But because again, free staters and others helped, we got them on board. We figured out the history through people like Susan and her group of what it's about, and then Michelle here, and it was the perfect case. We ended up getting pretty much every single rhino in the legislature to vote for it. A whole bunch of Democrats to vote for it. When it finally passed the House, it was almost 70% of the House voted for constitutional carry, which was really impressive. Maine, just before we passed it, passed a different version that had like three different qualifiers on it, so it was it was one of the worst constitutional carry bills, but they were really proud of it because they had bipartisan support. And then we passed ours, which blew every other constitutional carry law out of the water. And of course, it also managed to have bipartisan support, so we we're really proud about that. Yeah, that's one of the many, many victories that uh, happened because of the uh, efforts of appreciators, uh, not only in legislature, but also working behind the scenes as activists. People who move here, if you're going to leave your, your past behind, or leave, maybe leave your family and job to move to a change place in New Hampshire, you know you're motivated. And people here have been excellent activists. Um, Rob asked me to mention a couple of their, for example, concrete victories we've had legislatively. Um, one has to do with civil asset forfeiture reform, or prohibiting civil asset forfeiture. And I thought it was good to bring this up because we have a few people in the room who are very active in, in passing that. The, to get, you, if you, you guys know that Celeste Victoria, when the, the 
government, the police basically take your private stuff without you convicting of a crime. In some cases, not, not even charging you with a crime, they just take your cash, your car, or your something else. But this, to get this finally to one of the better laws in the country now, it took five years across three different legislative sessions. Dan McGuire worked on it real hard for two years. I worked on it for two years, two years, and Michael Sylvia worked on it for two years. I think you were in when it finally passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These guys can speak to it better. That, that's the great thing. Now uh, it's like it's super justice. We got them to come in and testify at the hearings, and they point to New Hampshire as one of the better selected asset forfeiture uh, laws in the country, thanks to the work specifically of free standards. And you know, if those guys, these two gentlemen wouldn't have been working on it, as well as others behind the scenes like Kevin Bloom, you know, it, it probably would never would have seen the light of day in New Hampshire. Another one has to do with beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beer and Liberty Mix. Uh, Jess wants to add uh, civil asset. So, so civil asset forfeiture, uh, we have an arrest in the state uh, for uh, against a guy who had was transporting a, a hollowed out can that looked like maybe it was a drug courier can. He had about $3,800 on him that was confiscated. And <clears throat> so a bunch of people got pretty excited about this being a violation of civil asset forfeiture. Uh, I gave a call to the AG's office. They got a deputy AG and it was on the phone right away. And uh, the, uh, the deputy AG uh, spent about 20 minutes uh, explaining to me how they understood what civil asset forfeiture was, and then they explained the other parts of the code that they, they had to use to charge. And she said that until we get this can back uh, from the library or uh, the lab, um, we have to we have to process this like a seizure. Uh, but if, if the can does not come back contaminated, we're going to return this money right away, and that's exactly what happened. So, so it's really nice to see the theory and then to be able to call the AG's office and have them on top of it because they know it's so important. That's a great story. I heard that one. Awesome. Back to beer. It used to be, <laughs> it, to be a beer brewer in New Hampshire, you have to have a license like everywhere. I think federal license and a state license under the New Hampshire liquor laws. Uh, but Kevin Bloom, an awesome um, volunteer, free sitter, and small uh, brewer pointed out that the barriers to entry were very high for brewers unless you're a Budweiser or a Smutty Nose, one of the big guys. You have these high fees and in many cases if you want to sell your own beer in the brewery in, on site and you have to provide food in the way of the kitchen. And some of you from other states know that you've seen the uh, uh, microbreweries and they have a nice kitchen and restaurant and bar and stuff. But his point was, why should you require a brewer to have a kitchen? Uh, you can be great at craft brews or brewing your own beverages, but you have nothing about running a kitchen. So he got Cal Pratt and me, we were both uh, Cal Pratt's on the to put in this bill. I said, there's lots of fresh, I didn't, didn't know what I was doing. He said, well, here's what you do, you know, write it up and submit it. And he worked behind the scenes and worked the committee, and we got this going where it drastically reduced the annual fee for beverage manufacturer, stripped out the requirement for the restaurant, and also allowed, it used to be prohibited, allowed these small brewers to uh, self-distribute. I know it sounds uh, like a no-brainer for libertarians, but uh, there are no libertarians in the liquor department, very few legislators, so this is a big battle. And since then, you guys know how uh, craft brews are popular, right? Since then, there are, uh, I think, over 60 of these small, called, so-called nano breweries in New Hampshire now. And it's a thriving industry. They've hired hundreds of people, and they've uh, made a lot of consumers very happy over the years, all because of the efforts of just a, a handful of Free State Project participants. So we're making a difference. Yeah, Shane. Yeah, my, my town has two nano breweries. Talking about. Uh, my town, Wolfboro, has two nano breweries that are very successful and a craft beer store. And this is a town of 6,000 people. 
So, you know, that, that's tremendous. It's, it's, you know, small businesses, the owners are young people, which is um, something we don't put a lot of in Wolfboro. So, and, you know, they're hiring people, it's great. Um, so thank you guys. Seamus ran for office last year. We're going to get him to run for state rep again. He's, uh, we work with him. Uh, we introduced one more state rep in the room, Andy Proud, back here from Hudson, Helen area. You guys are out of state. You, you're probably amazed in, in any group you're in, wherever you live now, to find one small libertarian in your legislature at all. Here we have five or six in one room <laughs> on a Saturday. And this is very common in New Hampshire. It's pretty amazing. Go ahead, to, to come to the next. Maybe you will get there, but you know, you're talking about free staters, but it's more than just free staters. And you're going to address that, right? No? Okay, I mean, it, there's a lot of liberty-oriented um, people in New Hampshire, and they're part of it, too. Um, there are people in the State House, and they have a, a liberty pack, yeah, or something. Uh, I don't know what it's called in the State House. Um, and they work together, and I mean, we're doing it all together. We're not on our own, we're not against anybody in New Hampshire, we're working with them. That's thanks, a for this, coming, thanks for fighting this out. Uh, if I were thinking about running for state rep, what's the actual time commitment like through each part of that process? <laughs> this is fantastic. You want to take this? It really depends on um, on how how busy you think you can be, uh, and then if you if you don't think you can be particularly busy, you let the leadership know that you shouldn't be assigned to a committee because it's the committee work that just soaks up your time. And then there are some committees are busier than other committees, so so that has an impact as well. So it can be kind of a minor sort of a commitment, or it, it could become more than a full-time job, and, and Representative McGuire is going to speak to that. Yes, in order to get elected, it takes, a, a, I think the minimum is about what I do. I go to, I'm in a flotarial district, I represent three towns. So I go to three old home days and march in the parade and shake hands, and I stand at three poles primary and at the general election, and if I feel like it, I do something else. Um, but this is the fifth time I ran, so it, it gets easier every time. Uh, in, to serve, the minimum it, that you can do and not feel ashamed of yourself is to show up at sessions and vote. That's, I don't know, maybe a dozen days in the spring, and once in the fall. You have to, you show up and you vote, uh, that will require a fair amount of reading in advance to read the bill so that you vote properly. But you could just show up on session day and vote if that's all you can manage. Uh, as just said, some committees are busier than others. Uh, there's a lot of competition to be on Fish and Game, for example, because that's one of the light ones. But if you get a not too busy committee, resources or whatever, you'll be, have maybe 10 days in addition to the session days when you'll have to be committed. And those again, January to June. If you want to and get involved on a busy committee, they'll love you, but you don't have to do it. Uh, if you want to get into leadership, it, it takes some time. If you want to get your bills passed, that takes time. So. You have to just, if you're going to go for the minimum amount of time, you have to decide you're not going to be sponsoring very many bills a day. But you can, in fact, show up every, every session day you vote properly, and your constituents will have not too much to complain about. They love you. Right? And, 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 and I like that. If you just show up and you vote right, you're winning. And we'll all love you for that. So and anything above and beyond that is great. The more that we can push out of the house that don't vote right, the better. Does anything thinking? Wow, running for office sounds like it costs tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> I, I work for a living. Can I run for office? You, in fact, you can. It, it, it is surprising that you don't have to spend all that much money to actually win a 
a state house election here in New Hampshire. Surprisingly, you can win the first time on a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars if you have zero name or how you're really rich. But, well, you know, I have good friends. Uh, but the second time around, once people know your name, it's probably not going to cost as much. Yeah, I would echo something that Jody said earlier the natives are great. That I go down to my local watering hole, hang out with a libertarian buddy, start talking about liberty stuff, and people just walk up out of the blue and say, I want to stop you right there because I just want to tell you I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> Which is, that didn't happen to me in California very often. <laughs> I think, I think Jess is overestimating how much, uh, sorry, Representative Edwards is overestimating how much it costs to run a campaign. I ran for about $700 for a full-time job, I got a kid, and you know, I can even go to some of the, the committee stuff, so it really, really can be anybody. You can get your work or whatever you go along with this, if this can be you. Uh, I never thought, no one, no one ever thought that Glenn would be in a state legislature in anywhere short of maybe uh, uh, Devil's Island, but uh, here I am, so this could be you. Thank you. And the last point on this is the representative proud sitting uh, just a few uh, rows behind you. You want to speak? All right. Uh, so I'm one of the representatives that I did decline to take the committee. And that was because I do work a full-time job and it was going to be a real problem for me to take even more time off. But I also have showed up every session day and voted. Um, we talked about the read-aheads. Uh, the other thing we learned out there is you make friends. You can learn pretty quick who you ideologically align with. They can help you with that. If you've had a hectic day, you have a full-time job, a uh, one-year-old and a three-year-old, sometimes things get hectic. You show up, you know who your friends are, you ask them, what did I miss? They will help you. So, um, yeah, and as far as running, I actually represent the largest state run district in the state. We elect 11, which also means it's the hardest because I need to reach out to the most voters. Uh, I think I spent somewhere around 1200 dollars $1,300, and I think I went over uh, The smaller districts, the, the city awards that have two or three representatives, you can spend a lot less because you have a lot less people to reach out to. Thank you. So we are activists and in the political realm and sitting at home and thinking to ourselves, at least I do, like what impact do we really have? If any. So I know I have impact on my, both in my community, and positive one I hope, but uh, in the larger scale, the state level, do we really make a difference as, as free stages, as occupants? Uh, do they notice us? Do they uh, pay attention to what we care about, to our issues? And um, to, to tell this story, we're going to start with uh, just as Edward in a minute. So there was a very a um, conservative, tending libertarian uh, speaker of the House in New Hampshire. He was elected in, um, in 20, what was it? I missed it. 2011, yes. He was elected in 2010 for the 2011-12 uh, uh, term. And a lot of uh, free senators were there with him in the House. Actually, you can say got him elected uh, to speaker, and he did wonders. It was uh, fantastic to hear. And uh, from there we went into a democratic regime and uh, there was some regression in our level of success. And then um, came another uh, period of a uh, Republican regime, but the speaker who was elected this time was uh, not at all uh, friendly, to say the least. And just said, well, what happened to Speaker Jasper? Well, okay, so the story of Speaker Jasper and Bill O'Brien is that uh, uh, Bill O'Brien was selected to uh, become the Speaker of the House uh, by the Republican majority. Um, and when you become Speaker of the House, it, it's, you get voted on by the entire House. And so there was another gentleman who had been in the House for quite a long time. His family had been in before he had been. And his name was Sean Jasper. <clears throat> and Sean um, had enough friends on the Democrat side that between the aristocrats uh, uh, and, and the Democrats, he was actually able to engineer uh, a victory for Speaker of the House. And so, so we, we ended up with the Speaker of the House who, uh, you know, kind of in a way owed as much political capital to the Democrats as, as he did to the Republicans, certainly the conservative Republicans, because the conservative Republicans were all Bill O'Brien people. And so this led to 
um, a couple a couple three years where we had a speaker in the house who was not really uh, a friend to the conservatives in the house um, and would uh, get into social media and into the news criticizing uh, some of us for, for actually being conservative so it wasn't a very healthy thing um, fortunately, a Republican governor came around and had a brilliant idea, and that was to offer him something that would really appeal to him. He made him the commissioner of, of agriculture. So he stepped down as the Speaker of the House, and now we have um, kind of a, a, a caretaker in office, uh, another aristocrat, but he's kind of fun to listen to. What's his name? <laughs> Oh, uh, Gene Chamberlain, that's right. I mean, Gene's a nice guy. I should know his name, but... But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but what, was, what was really... What's, what Gene Chandler has done, because we put up some great candidates to also be co-speaker of the House, Carol at one time, uh, Lori uh, Sanborn, uh, several other really conservatives. What, what, what Gene Chandler, I think, picked up on is that uh, there was a real divide within the Republican Party, and he wanted to uh, heal it. So, into his leadership, he, he accepted some of the uh, uh, crazier, more conservative people. Um, and, and so, at least now, I think there's uh, a more balanced leadership. And Gene Chandler has promised that uh, if he wins and we retain the majority in 18, he's not going to run again, which will open it up. And so, I'm hoping when we open it up, we have somebody of to Carol McGuire's uh, caliber to, to step up and, and basically carry her flag for him. So, is that it? Yes, I wanted to hear a little bit more about the free staters part of that. Oh, okay, so the free staters. Um, I, I think it's already been brought up that it's not just free staters. Mm -hmm. There are probably 80 to 100 really good Republicans, of which you know, maybe 40 of us, I don't, I don't really know a head count, uh, uh, have some association with the Free State Party, or the um, Free State Project. <laughs> Free State Project. And, uh, and so, um, so, so we have found, I think, a lot of really great natural allies. In my district in Rocky Mountain 4, there are five of us. One is a retired uh, Navy uh, doctor, Joe Hagan, who's the chairman of the judiciary who has told me just straight up, and I don't know if he thought I was free stater or not, so I really love having free staters in New Hampshire because they vote like us, so that's good. <laughs> and, and, then, and, then, and then there's another guy uh, who, who makes me feel stupid because uh, he's so conservative, a guy named Chris True. Chris True's on transportation. Chris is a, Chris is a gem, you know, and so, so between the, the natives who, who get this liberty thing and the, and the, and the fresh blood coming in from uh, outside, we probably have 80, 90 good votes, and that's enough to influence things at times. But we just still have too many rhinos. We have about 30, 40 rhinos. You can't really trust where they go, and they go the wrong way too often. Well. So we need to crush them. If you live in Salem, please help us crush them. Thank you. Can you do Thanks. Hey, uh, Keith, uh, this year we have, um, for the first time or last year, the Freedom Caucus. Yes, and the books. But let's talk about it and the budget battle a little bit. Okay, so now is the time for the raffle. There's a little bit of time, so we're going to give away the two books. Well, this first name, we'll see. We'll see who it is. I'm not good with pronouncing names. I know that Jess do it. Jess. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. Jack. Lions. Jeff Lions. Step Lions in the room? No? Okay, we'll move on. All right. There you go. Oh, do you have to be here to win? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Selectman Dennis Goddard. Dennis Goddard. <laughs> Which book do you want, Dennis Goddard? Which book? Uh, take, we, take one right now. Take one. I want the better one. Go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Touch your car one more. One more. Let's see. Here you go. Mitch Dyer from Cumberland, New Hampshire. Mitch Dyer is not in the room. Here you go. This is so great I can pronounce all these. Uh, Brent Tweed. Oh, so Brent true. Tweed. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's another raffle at our table at 5 p.m., so all these people still have a chance to win silver and to get a ball table in the vendor area. 
Andy Hunick. Yeah. Oh! Yeah. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> you get the signed copy of James O'Keefe's newest book. Right. Yeah. Now you're going to talk about the caucus? For a minute. Okay. <laughs> so there is a caucus. So when Mark was in, there was something called the Natural Rights Organization. And this new Freedom Caucus is sort of modeled after that, but obviously most people here have also heard of the Freedom Caucus in D.C. So J.R. Hall is not a free stater, but has been supported by free staters, get involved back and others over the years, is the founder of this Freedom Caucus. And the Freedom Caucus, ad hoc, maybe there's 80 members, maybe there's 60, technically they're not members, and it's, it's just like in D.C. No one really knows who's in it. All we know is they have immense power because for the first time in my lifetime, the House, the New Hampshire House, they didn't even put forward a, well, they put a ballot, they, they put a budget up, but they voted it down. So the Senate had to start with their own budget. Normally the House starts with the budget, just like in D.C., then the Senate, then the governor. So because the House budget, as proposed by Jasper, who's no longer around, um, it, it included no tax cuts. There, there were increases in spending, but no tax cuts. So thankfully, there's a lot of free staters and other good people in the Freedom Caucus that said, what the, and they shut it down. And of course, the Senate realized no budget would ever pass the House unless it included multiple tax cuts. So they made sure to not only include business tax cuts, multiple business tax cuts in the Senate budget, but they, they eliminated a tax even. And they only did this, again, because the people in the Freedom Caucus which again, we wouldn't have that power without free staters, our friends, their friends. Jody, I think, might have left, but her point is well taken. Okay, that was fair. Very good. So we are gonna end very soon. I wanna end on a very high note. And uh, my talk is about the education setting accounts bill that is being uh, debated uh, right now in Concord. This is gonna make a huge difference for children in the state, a huge life-changing different for, for a lot of kids. Kids so will choose to uh, use this program with their parents. And I, I'm dwelling on this because I want to explain to you how important free status were for this legislation. So there are many different people working on this for many years. Ten years ago, a free stater in a little town of Croydon, uh, and he was at, um, on, the, on the school uh, committee of the town, and he basically wanted to start a school choice program in, in the town of Cornwall. This is a town of 700 people. And uh, he slowly uh, convinced other parents and school board members and voters that why not? Why do we have to sign up with a failing school district where we can send the kids to any good school that the parents choose that fits the kids' needs? That was 10 years ago. Joey Underwood took it over about seven years ago. And brought this all the way to the Croydon Bill, as uh, just described earlier, I'm not gonna re re repeat this. But what happened here is there were already established so many organizations in New Hampshire that are focused on school choice. So many volunteers were involved in that. There was infrastructure, there was, um, um, we built uh, you know, online presence, websites, groups, Homeschoolers are meeting regularly, homeschooler conferences, etc., etc. This infrastructure was built over time, and a lot of it is by free staters, not all of us, but a lot of it is both as organizers and as participants. And as a result of that, once the Croydon bill uh, went to court and we lost the first time, finally the government changed here, we got a Republican governor. And then that's the moment, I think, where a lot of organizations from out of the state took notice. And they notice that we can do stuff here. There are enough people, enough interest, a lot of energy behind school choice in New Hampshire, and they became involved. And their involvement and the still more work of all those endless, you know, tireless volunteers brought together this bill that is being debated now and hopefully will pass. It might pass in the next few months, and that will allow this new freedom in education in the state. So uh, free status make a huge difference. They make a difference with their volunteer time, with their ideas. Ideas that they bring in prevail. It takes time, it's not overnight, it's not the first time you, people hear this new idea that they immediately sign up. No, they need to hear it the second time, the third time, and more. 
But with a lot of work at the town level and the state level, those ideas actually penetrate. And eventually, 10 years later, there's a big change in, say, education. Everybody can see. And people in the state know, people other outside of the state know this is, this is, this is national news. So free centers make a big difference, and you can become one of those people. Uh, first, you have to move here, if you're not already here. And then, please run for office. Get involved in your community, whether it's in your town level, if you can do better, or you want to you know, go to the state level, do that. We are here, uh, we have a table, we will answer your questions. We have uh, 15 events all over the state in the next two, three months to teach exactly that. We're going everywhere, we'll be in King, we'll be in Berlin, we'll be in Exeter, Manchester, Nashua, everywhere. Come to our event, we'll hold your hand, we'll teach you how to do it, how to do it. There's a lot of knowledge, you know, there's all those reps here, they, they taught us how they did it, we can teach you, and uh, we will make sure you make the best of it, hopefully you get elected, and from that point on, other organizations will take you on. Just so, so I just want to say it because you're too modest to do it. Uh, the Get Involved Pack is, is headed up by Rob, Mark, and Keith. And even if you're not moving here anytime soon, you can help in New Hampshire now by donating money. So if you've got extra money that you don't need, uh, they'll take it and they'll invest it in your future here in New Hampshire.